Hi, I'm Sue and I am the pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Lincoln, Nebraska and welcome to our YouTube channel. Today's sermon is one I had the privilege of preaching just this past week at the First Presbyterian Church in Hastings, Nebraska for their Gifts of Women Sunday. And I got to tell some fun stories about the early church. We talked about stereotypes and how God gives everyone gifts, not just women. If you find our videos meaningful, hit the subscribe button right now. Stick around after the message. I'll give you a little more info about how you could get involved and be a part of what God is doing here. But meanwhile, let's listen to the sermon. Let's start out with our next scripture reading. It's from the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. If you're not familiar with the history of Israel at that time, the 12 tribes were just a loose confederation of tribes. They were not a nation of Israel at that point. And so whenever a threat would rise up against one or two of the tribes, uh, a small group of them would kind of gather together and a person would just rise up from their midst, someone touched by God to lead them in battle through that time of crisis. And so that's what we're going to hear about right now. So during the time, oh, that was just the introduction I gave you. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the, king, the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and they had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord God of Israel commands you, Go take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, and from the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon, and with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 warriors went up behind him, and Deborah went up with him. This is the word of God still speaking. Thanks be to God. So it so happened in the city of Antioch in the 5th century AD, the 5th century of our Lord, that the bishops and clergy had gathered to worship God. Bishop Nonus was handed the gospel and the Bishop of Antioch begged him to speak. And so Bishop Nonus spoke of sacrifice and love and the judgment to come and the eternal blessings. And so stirred were the people by the Holy Ghost who spoke through him that it was said that the pavement was wet with tears. It also so happened that a noted prostitute of the city, Pelagia, walked by and heard the bishop's preaching, and she was moved to repent of her sins. That same day, Bishop Nonus baptized her, and she became a Christian. Eight days later, she disappeared and was never seen again. Many years later, talk was heard about a famed monk who lived in a hut on the side of the Mount of Olives. And this monk was known to be very wise, and people came from all over to seek wisdom and teaching from him about the faith. The monk died, and the good fathers and brothers went to the hut and opened it and carried out his small body as if it were as precious as gold and jewels. However, it didn't take long for them to discover that this most holy and revered teacher in Jerusalem was no ordinary man. You see, eight days after being baptized, Pelagia stole the bishop's clothes, traveled to the Mount of Olives, built a hut, 
and lived the rest of her life as one of the most revered holy men in Jerusalem. Pelagia had the gift of wisdom, but in those days, no one was going to listen to a woman. The gift of wisdom is one of many that Paul mentions in his letters to the Corinthians, gifts that God gifts for the common good and for building up the church. Unfortunately, as you look at the history of the church, you are more likely to hear about gifted men than gifted women, more about the, the church fathers, and sometimes you aren't even aware that there were actually church mothers as well. It used to be that the contribu contributions of women to the faith was overlooked. Their contributions to missionary work and to the church were hidden and even denied to the point that we ended up with centuries of women discounting their own gifts. And that still happens today. I will never forget a member of the second church I served. Uh, she would never, ever accept a nomination to be an elder in that church because she simply believed that women were not gifted with those kinds of gifts of leadership. And this from a woman who ran such a successful building, uh, company that her little town of 500 had a post office. The post office was closing down post offices in small towns all over Illinois. But her one business had enough going on that they got to keep their post office. But she didn't believe that God gave women leadership gifts. God did not shortchange women when it came to gifts. In fact, quite the opposite. Who would have guessed among the great leaders of Israel, um, Joshua, Samson, Gideon, Samuel would be the name Deborah. Deborah is described, I don't know if you caught it in the reading, as the wife of Lapidoth. The literal translation is woman of fire. And one just has to wonder, if the translators of scripture were uncomfortable with the woman having her own standing, she had to be the wife of rather than her own person. But whenever you read about Deborah, remember she is described as woman of fire. I never forget that. Deborah did not hesitate to speak. When God spoke to her, she did not hesitate to lead an army into battle. She was a formidable woman and she had many gifts. God gave her ability and wisdom and charisma. God gave her gifts of leadership to the point that even in that patriarchal society of Israel, people listened to her. They recognized that and they followed her. Even to the point that Barak would not go into battle without her. Deborah, of course, wasn't the only great woman of faith. There was Esther. Esther interceded with the king of Persia when the king's advisor was plotting genocide against the Israelites. Now, we aren't told that Esther had any special gifts or skills. She was simply in the right place at the right time. Maybe that was her gift at that moment. And instead of asking, who will step up for us, she stepped up. Uh, stepped up. In the New Testament, we read about Phoebe, Paul mentions Phoebe as one of the deacons of the church. It only took Presbyterians another 1,900 years to realize that God could call women to be deacons and leaders in the church, much less elders and pastors. There was Prisca. Prisca was the leader of a church in her house, Paul tells us. Mary Magdalene was the very first person, not just woman, but first person, commissioned to preach the gospel of the resurrection by Jesus. And of course, there was that other Mary, chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. Now, if I were just speaking to women today, I would say that the church would be in sad shape if it weren't for women. And that's true. It would be. I think we all recognize that. If you look at any church roster today, and my guess is this church is probably similar, you're easily going to have 60 to 65 percent of the membership are women, and the rest are men, or other genders. But women have long, since the early days of the church, made up the majority of those actually involved. 
So yes, the church would be in sad shape today if it weren't for women. And of course it would be in sad shape today if it weren't for everybody else as well. But today we're talking about women. And women played a much larger part in the history of the church than most people know. Here's the rest of your history lesson for today. Tombstones, I love cemeteries. Tombstones is those first few centuries tell us that many house churches were led by women. There is a Bishop Diogenes. We know nothing about him except the only claim to fame on his tombstone was that he was the Bishop of Ammion the Elder, a woman. And oftentimes it was women who had the financial resources to start monasteries and missions. Now these women were not any better or more gifted than anybody else. They were not more holy, they were not more worthy, they were not more uh, privileged. They simply used the gifts they had, the gifts God gave them to build up the church. God has showered the church with an abundance of gifts. And they're not all reserved for women. What are some of the gifts in this church? Some of you, I know, have the gift of compassion. Every church has people with those gifts. You know who's going through a hard time, and you are just magically there when needed. I tell you, pastors love people like you because you're the ones who call us and say, did you know that Joe or Mary is going through a hard time? Because you're going to know before we will. Some of you have the gift of teaching. You have a natural ability to share information in a way that makes other people want to learn. Some of you have the gift of hospitality and making other people feel welcome. You have the gift of connecting with children and youth. There are those among you who could fix just about everything. God has blessed some of you with wealth. You have the gift of financial giving. Some of you have the gift of discernment, clarity in the midst of confusion. Some, God has given simply the gift of time. You are able to show up when others can't. Now, I suspect there are some here who think that God could never use you. Maybe you think you aren't good enough, that you don't know enough, uh, that you're too ordinary. Well, I always use myself as the example to combat that idea because I thought God had an incredible sense of humor in calling me to be a pastor because I remember to this day standing in a college class, having to give an oral presentation with my three by five note cards, never looking up and my hands shaking the whole time. And here I am today. I am not convinced, by the way, that preaching is the best gift God gives a church. It just happens to be one God has given me. The 23rd Psalm says, my cup overflows. And that's what I see when I look at the church. A cup overflowing with good gifts. Everything we need to be the church in this time and this place. What amazes me is that so often we refuse to drink that cup. Maybe feel unworthy that God's gifts are for others and not for you. You may feel inadequate to the task, forgetting that with the gift comes with the power to use it. Maybe because you aren't proficient in something, you feel you don't have that gift. Well, gifts don't always come perfectly done. They have to be developed. I will bet you anything that any of you who are good at anything weren't good when you first started. You had to develop that gift. And I think sometimes we also do still buy into those stereotypes that say, well, some people are just naturally gifted to do this and others not. For women, that is especially an issue. And I can't tell you how many women think, and it's usually women that think this, more than men, by the way, how many women think that they should never serve on a finance committee because it's the men who have those gifts? Two stories. Every single woman, or every single person on my finance committee is a woman. We don't have any men on it. And frankly, I'd rather have the women. They know what they're doing, and they're good. And uh, I don't know if your church has ever done this, but 
I had a church once that had a worship service that was, um, you know, kind of trying to recreate the 1920s. And when it, so men sat on one side and women on the other. And you know what happened when it came time for the offering? The men had to go up and go to their wives to get the money. <laughs> don't tell me women don't have the gifts of dealing with money. So forget the stereotypes. But I think the other thing that happens, though, sometimes we just want to sit in our pew and we don't want to put forth the effort to use the abilities God has given us. One of the things Paul said in that reading from the Corinthians, no one is expendable. What would have happened if Deborah had said no to that call to lead Israel into battle? What would have happened if Esther had said, I'm just a woman, what can I do? Oh, poor me, too bad, we're all going to die. What would have happened if that young woman 2,000 years ago had said no when asked to bear the Son of God? And what would have happened if 150 years ago that small group of people who gathered together to form this church had said no? No. What will happen if you say no? Or better yet, what will happen if you say yes? God has blessed you with many wonderful gifts. And in doing so, God has blessed this church. So your cup really does overflow. If you don't know what your gifts are, Go home and pray about it. Ask your family and friends. I can guarantee you they will be able to tell you what your gifts are. And then ask yourself, how can I use that gift so that this church in another 150 years will say thank you for saying yes. As you go out this day, don't forget to ask yourself, what are the gifts God has given me? What are the gifts God has given your spouse, your child, your friend? Help each other figure that out because God has given us all gifts to build up this church and beyond that to make our world a better place. And it's going to take everyone, regardless of gender, to make that happen. So be a part of what God is doing in this world. And I know you will, for you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the people of God. And God goes with you. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's message. At First Presbyterian Church, we believe we aren't meant to do life alone. We were made to do life with others. If you're looking for a community of people who will meet you and welcome you and love you and accept you just as you are, then click the link below in the description and head over to our website, fpclincoln.org, to find out how you can join one of our groups or studies and get connected to other people. Or if you just want some information about the church or want to talk to someone, you can fill out a Connect card and someone from our team will reach out to you. The link for that card is also right below this video in the description. Every week, we get to hear stories about people who find God through these messages and whose lives were changed. None of this would be possible without the amazing generosity of the people here at First Presbyterian Church. If you would like to be a part of helping this life-changing message continue to go out online each week, you can make a donation. You can click on the link below in the description or just click the Give tab on our website. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for being a part of Changing Lives. And thank you for watching our video today. Be sure to look around our YouTube channel and check out the other messages to help you on your journey. And again, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll get notified every time we put out a new video. We love you, and we hope you have a great day.